I got this guy who says he's president-elect Moloch on the line again. He was on the line with us last night, and we just don't have time for you. You know, I've got the black shirt on. I've got a, a closet full of, like Superman has his Superman shirt. I've got a closet full of black shirts now because I'm wearing a black shirt every single day for the next four <laughs> years because I am in mourning <clears throat> for the country that I love, America. So, nah, bye. So, welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson, and we are back from our show last night to continue our discussion about Standing Rock in the Dakotas and uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, which will, if built, ultimately leak into a river and destroy drinking mm -hmm. water for millions of people. So, on that chipper note, um, <laughs> On that chipper note, um, you, you wanted to, to mention about a, a conversation that you had with someone out there at, that turns out, well, being in the right place at the right time? Yes. Uh, one of the things that really came home to me uh, during our trip was that so many things happened that we hadn't planned on. We would have a plan for <laughs> what we were going to accomplish as volunteers during the afternoon, mm -hmm. and it would turn out to be anything but How what so? we planned on. Um, well, very briefly, our main plan was to help out in the kitchens mm -hmm. and to deliver supplies and to, you know, walk from campsite to campsite and, and be of use however we could. <clears throat> the main thing that we did was to ferry people back and forth between camp and our hotel room <laughs> and over the course of six days and evenings provided 18 showers for people who had been camping out for weeks or perhaps months to whom a shower was, you know, a gift of, of God. Right. So, um, but many little things during the time that we were there happened, and one of the most delightful, and I hope that Laura will forgive me for telling this story. <clears throat> and I watched it unfold. Ah, um, yes, Laura Sage, whom, whom I met last Wednesday night at the Democracy for America meetup, and who will be joining us at some future date yes. on the show to talk You'll be about. Very lucky to have her here. Um, <clears throat> it was one of the afternoons and we realized that there were more donations in the back of the car that we needed to uh, disperse. Yep. So I got out of the car and I had um, a hat in one hand and something else in the other. I don't remember what it was. Well, which place do I go to first? So I thought I was making the decision to deliver the hat to the clothing donation place. <clears throat> now, I, in retrospect, I'll tell you that I was I was supposed to go there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking to, to see where to put this particular item, and it was a favorite hat of mine from home, and I just felt like I needed to leave something personal there. And I'm musing about this sort of to the air, and there was a young woman who was working there, um, also helping with sorting out donations, and it kind of drew us into a conversation about hats and about leaving favorite things there, and the conversation just, you know, went on for several minutes, and then it was time for us to part company. And we both sort of at the same time started to say, it was really nice to meet you, and we said it with the same words, and apparently we said it with the same inflection because she said, um, <laughs> you, must be, you must be from the same area that I'm from. <clears throat> and I said, Connecticut? 
and she said, um, I said, my name's Deborah, and she finished my name. She said, Deborah Cohen. And I looked at her and I said, Laura, Laura Sage? The reason we knew this was because we had intended to meet up with each other and meet personally for the first time for an entire week. And it didn't happen until this last afternoon that we were there and I happened to decide to go and deliver a hat. And Laura happened to be working there and we happened to start talking to each other. So when we realized who we were and that this meeting was finally taking place, we threw our arms around each other and started jumping up in the air. <laughs> yay, yay, we must have looked like two two people in need of care. Um, <coughs> well, it, now, was a, it was a perfect example of something happening yeah. that had not been planned. Now what Joe at the next <coughs> table is asking me, he's mouthing it, and I can, I can read lips a little bit, people in Connecticut have accents? I, I assume yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Of course we do. Yeah. Of course we do. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't have the, we don't have the most more pronounced ones like a, like a, like a, a Minnesota yeah <coughs> or, a, or, a, or a southern drawl. Of course, there are, every state has its own different southern drawl, as I've learned over the years. But um, well, there was just something about my inflection to yeah. put it together. Yeah, well, of course we have an accent. Right. Of course we do. At least those of us that have been in Connecticut for <coughs> for a few years. Right. So you're there, and you're doing a number of duties each day to help keep the campsites going. What was the spirit like? Kind of, what kind of, what, what was the feeling? Did, did, were people upset at the, the, the atrocities that <coughs> happened, such as the, uh, the, the spraying of the water cannons? Were they upset by, the, by the, the strip searches and the cavity searches and all the other disgusting things that were done? We were out there before those things happened. Okay. We came back before right. reports okay. of those came in. Okay, okay. Um, so you didn't, you weren't there, friend, to, to right, have a, right. have an opportunity to react to any of that, any of those things. There was a great sense of cultural pride mm. um, that was evident throughout the entire camp. Yeah, yep, and there was that sense of purpose. Um, <clears throat> they knew that there had to be things that needed to be done, and there were. One of the things that I found very interesting is that when we first got there. The, it's a requirement that you go to an introductory, introductory workshop mm -hmm. or so there must have been a hundred of us in this dome and we were explained um, that we were guests we were explained that there is a lot to do if you have a good suggestion keep it to yourself because it's probably been discussed at some point or other and it's really not up to us to implement all of these great ideas mm. that we might possibly have. Because they've already been thought of probably <coughs> before and More, already, yes, already been implemented because yes. of so much planning. And it's, and and the it's truly not our place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were guests. Well, we're guests. guests. You were guests, we're, we're not, the you guests. Weren't tourists. You were guests. Yeah. There, were no, there was no expectation on, on anyone else, but every expectation on you to stand up and assist in any way that yes, they yeah. knew from the months of experience of having been there that all the, the uh, assistful things that, uh, that you could be doing to make life better for all the people that were sacrificing <coughs> days, weeks, months of their months. time. Yeah. And as a white woman from Wethersfield, Connecticut, I was truly, you know, yeah. a minority presence um, in a very different culture. One which I'm embarrassed to say I don't know nearly enough about, mm -hmm. given that we have been living side by side with a really brutal history for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, America's known for, for doing some, some pretty <coughs> horrific things to our Native right. cultures, to right. our Native Americans. Right. And what we have to do, too, is we have to remember that we have to be part, we have to acquiesce to their culture. Mm -hmm. right. That's not the right word. When in Rome, yep. But one of the things that really <coughs> bothered me mm -hmm. was that women, for the most part, were requested to wear skirts. Mm -hmm. And I was quite taken aback. Yes. And that was not yeah. something that, that I really did willingly. Yeah. Well, I understand. It's, it's their custom, <coughs> it's their mm -hmm. culture, until somebody explained to me that 
Well, here, mm -hmm. women wear skirts. Mm -hmm. In this area, they wear shawls. Yeah. So. Very similar, probably, to people that go to, um, to a, a Muslim country mm -hmm. and are asked respectfully to uh, <coughs> follow the their, their mm -hmm. culture, wear the scarf, right. wear the hijab, and, and that's just how you dress. And I, and I think I appreciate that more. For them. Now. And to be honest with you, another layer of clothing didn't hurt in that cold. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Another layer of something. What was the weather like while you were out there? I know you weren't out there once the weather really turned horrific, but what was it like when you were out there? Wind. It was very windy. Um, I was able, I, I was wearing lots of layers and I was able to, during the day, keep my jacket unzipped mm -hmm. much of the time, mm -hmm. but the wind was, was pretty brutal. Um, Which Compared to the second trip, it was balmy, but we didn't know that at the time. Yeah, so, it was, so. so what was a, a horrible wind the first time out for you, you realized the second time out was, was not, yeah, so was hor not so horrible after <laughs> yeah, just, all, yeah, compared to what you had, what right. you experienced the second time out. Um, <coughs> in between shows, we talked a little bit about a conversation you had with someone who, um, you know, something to keep in mind if you're ever involved mm. anywhere where you're concerned about there being a plant for the opposition trying to disrupt things for the good you're trying to do, there's always going to be at least one out there, but usually they're pretty subtle about things. Tell us subtle. about your conversation with the young man, the, the uh, reporter. I take it. Oh, yes. He was a reporter and he, he had... Independent reporter. Independent he was reporter. on his own. <coughs> and he had an in with the head of security. Mm -hmm. ah. And so it was just so bizarre that he was flaunting this information that he knew that he had. And he said that there was all sorts of drugs and illicit and alcohol on there. And, and I'm not going to say, that I'm truthfully not going to say that there isn't. Our first experience, when we first got into the camp, mm -hmm. he said, do you know the rules of the camp? And we said, yes, there are no drugs, mm -hmm. no alcohol, no firearms. This is at the window as you're driving in. They yeah. stop your car and... So, <coughs> so immediately, we're very much aware of this. And he was explaining that all of this was happening, and, but he was so proud of it. And we were sitting, there were five of us at the table, and we were really secretly laughing at him because he really, he was just so obvious but that made us realize that, of course, there are provocateurs everywhere. Did he hide it or was he open about it? Oh, he was so open. He was extremely open, at least with us. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so at the camp, ah, because oh, we okay. saw him off the camp property. Yeah. We saw him when we were having supper at the casino, so. It's, an, it's interesting. Yeah. You have to realize that, that <coughs> as much as you want to trust somebody, you can't necessarily trust them. And you mentioned, uh, you mentioned off camera between shows why, why he was so certain about there being drugs there. <laughs> well, that was, well, because, you know, he'd done them with them. <laughs> 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 you know, your credibility sort of goes out the window yeah. when you want to make a complaint about somebody and, and list yourself as an accomplice. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, and uh, certainly... Um, <clears throat> Certainly, that's, um, that's no way to, to, as you say, no way to, to show yourself to be of any integrity at all. Right. Agreed. Even, if, even if you were a journalist. Yeah. But, but one of the things um, that I found that, you know, first, the first time we went through, they said, you know, you don't do these things. Mm -hmm. But each time we went through the, the gate again, the yep. north gate, they all said, whoops, I'm going to lose it. <coughs> Welcome home. I know. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Those two words were so powerful because I never expected whoops, <laughs> to, to have that feel like home. <coughs> and and yet. yet it was. You know, just for those few days and, and that simple welcome. So. And I know that um, I know when you go somewhere and you're greeted in such a such a wonderful way that you develop a lot of lifelong friendships lifelong attachments oh, yeah, to exactly. other other human beings right. to find out that there are people that are that are doing the same good that you're doing 
in that difficult setting, it's, it, it's heartening. <clears throat> well, you know, I can liken it to the sense of community that I discovered and took to heart and will never, ever lose when I was working for Bernie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. There, the, the spirit of community and family that developed among so many of us who were working together was, was as tight as you can imagine. And that was the same kind of feeling that I got after just having been at Standing Rock for a, a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So when I would talk about going home, meaning coming back here to Connecticut, I talked about um, going back to my first home because Standing Rock felt like a second home. <clears throat> and you're right, when we drove into camp that one day toward the end of the week, yeah. and this young man looked into the window, and I think at, at this point had recognized us because he wasn't asking the questions anymore, <laughs> and he just said, welcome home. It was an overwhelming sense of community and belonging and purpose and determination. And I have to tell you, being home now, being so far away from it mm -hmm. um, is uncomfortable on several levels. But what we need to realize is that those of us who cannot be there for whatever reason, whether it be not being able to deal with the winter weather or having family commitments or whatever, there are lots of other things that we can do to be absolutely as supportive as we were there on the premises. Quick shout out to, um, to everybody in the audience that didn't <coughs> happen to be sitting here in the restaurant with us last night. Um, that uh, we are on online, uh, Facebook, Progressive Soup, YouTube, Kristen40, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-4-0. But the easiest way to find us is Google it and or go to um, Facebook, Progressive Soup, and you can see the show that we did last night. And that'll fill you in a little bit on how this discussion began to evolve and it's actually now noon 30 on Thursday and we're in the second half of our discussion. Okay, what, what speaking, of, speaking <laughs> of soup. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, while I've never met this person, I've been talking with her for quite a bit. Um, and she, her name is Ronnie, mm -hmm. and she's a chef from Texas that had given up her home and a lot put her belongings in storage and she's actually a chef mm -hmm. or a cook in one of the um, areas and what she had said today was the fact that and this will tell you what the weather is like everything that she has for food is frozen cans of food are frozen so you have to plan your meals and you have to thaw them out a couple of days beforehand now her kitchen is within one of those big military tents mm -hmm. and she said so in there the refrigerator depends upon which place in this tent that you put something and the freezer is the other part of the tent that you put something so what was she <coughs> saying and in fact that it's pretty damn cold out there it was ass chilling cold I imagine yes, yes. and she <laughs> I think probably more than that and um, I'm, I'm just in awe of the people that are out there with a, such a purpose now her purpose is yes to fight the pipeline or to support the pipeline um, protectors but she she went right after she's military so she went right after the military went and they had asked her to go yeah so this is I find very important and I do have her information if anybody would yeah. like it um, <clears throat> and I'm not usually fond of PayPal because it's really not transparent but I happen to personally know this person and I really would trust her. Mm -hmm. And when you send money through PayPal, then there's no fees taken out. So her name is Ronnie. It's Ronnie Mathis. And her address on PayPal is R-O-N-I at Chef Ronnie. That would be C-H-E-F-R-O-N-I dot com. Mm -hmm. and her last reach out was she really needed some oranges for her people because she's the only camp she's the only kitchen that serves breakfast and that's really important 
Yeah. Okay. So basically, please send Ronnie money so she can buy supplies and yes. feed the people who were there <laughs> doing what has to be done. Let's go back to the nuts and bolts, because we were talking uh, about how there was a pipeline. This DAPL pipeline was originally scheduled to cross the river, Not go, 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 go a different no, route, go, go, go a different Smart. route and end up, and end up <clears throat> a, well, for lack of, for lack of a, a better word, let's call it a white town. And the white folks in the white town were very successful in fighting against the pipeline coming through their area which is why the pipeline was rerouted right. through this sacred burial grounds that had belonged to Native Americans. <clears throat> what, are the, what's, what are the ramifications of this pipeline being built? What, what can happen? What problems can this, these pipelines cause? Not just on a, not just on a, a burial ground uh, level, but on an environmental level. What can happen if the pipeline is built? Well, what they are waiting to do at this very moment is to put the pipeline, a, a, a section of the pipeline, underneath the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. um, gee, I don't know what could possibly happen there. <laughs> um, one little leak, one little leak that's not detected for how much, uh, you know, how long a period of time, and then when it's finally detected, how many millions of gallons of oil are already in the in the water. Um, it can poison an entire water supply for 18 million people. And it's not just that it will poison the water supply and we'll have to look for an alternative for a while. We all know that cleaning up these oil spills does, you know, if it happens at all, it doesn't happen for a very, very long time. So we're looking at a very long-term devastation of a, vital, of, a, of a vital ingredient for our lives. Mm. Um, <coughs> and, the, the and the quality <coughs> of the pipe mm -hmm. is the least the gr the li the least grade, mm -hmm. the, not the not lowest, the, the lowest, the lowest grade. grade, yes, um, and so that right there, and and besides, it's not supposed to end up in our heating tanks. It's going to be processed and then sh and then shipped away out of the United States. So it's not it's not to any benefit to anyone that lives in the United States. No, just to the companies <coughs> that, that just to uh, the tra company. transport, export to somewhere right. else. And it's right. the, the, the crappiest of crappy, I guess that's a, a scientific term, the, the crappiest of crap oil that there is coming out of um, Canadian tar sands. Yes. It's the, it's the most corrosive <coughs> oil. It's the worst of the worst of the worst oil you could possibly, it's not crude, it's not grade A crude by any means. It isn't anything that Washington would want to have coming across the lawn in front of the White House. <laughs> it isn't anything Ooh, that any of the people one. in Congress <laughs> yeah. would I like, like you know, skirting their neighborhoods or their grandchildren's neighborhoods. Um, and that's the whole problem. It's not going through the neighborhoods of anybody who's making the decision. Yeah, and it's, it's not benefiting anyone in, in the United States, no. except for the 40 guys that are going to be there for a couple of years building it, and maybe one or two people after that that maintain it until it, until it leaks. Until it leaks, and it will leak, I'm, I'm convinced. Yeah, that's, again, as we mentioned in the first show, um, <coughs> um, akin to uh, when Kristen and I went out to Mayflower, Arkansas, which had had a, one, of the, one of the original Keystone pipelines that it, that it, uh, that it leaked. And uh, they, they got lucky there because it was a part of the pipeline that was above ground, and it spilled into a neighborhood and ruined an entire neighborhood. But thankfully, they caught it quickly enough, because it was above ground, and as soon as it leaked, there, there it was on the ground. There was oil on the ground right. spewing out. And they caught it before it went into and ruined a lake. So but when you're going under the Missouri River and it leaks, it's like, it's uh, big time. Like, big, like BP with the Gulf of Mexico. That's right. You, know, you don't know it's leaking until, it's, until it bubbles to the surface. And by that time, it's ruined. Because you have to rely on detectors to, to even figure out that a leak is happening. Yeah. Before it's uh, evident, before everything reaches the surface. Then they're going to mosey on down to the river and, and send scuba divers right. in, if it's in season for scuba divers, to figure out where the leak is exactly. and to stop it. And that could be a long time. Right. And it could be a, a tremendous amount of oil. Um, can I follow Diane's okay. lead? <laughs> and. Um, just address another way that people can be supportive of the camp? Yes. We, we've been talking, we've been sitting here talking about our um, 
somewhat meager um, a contribution in comparison to the people who have been out there all this time. Mm -hmm. All of the water protectors who are out there risking their lives and, and who have been arrested. There are over 550 people who have been arrested and who are facing um, the court system. Mm -hmm. um, a court system that so far has not exactly been behaving itself the way we would hope. So if there are people who are interested in supporting the water protectors in their legal battle, mm -hmm. I would like to suggest. Um, <laughs> and you probably have a lot of attorneys that are, that are doing a lot of good stuff pro bono. Well, the National Lawyers Guild is involved. And mm -hmm. if you go to www.nlg.com, there is a place to make a donation that will go specifically toward um, the Legal Defense Fund yeah. for these folks. If you prefer to send a check, you can send it to the Water Protector Legal Collective. Mm -hmm at P.O. Box 69, 300 Collins Avenue in Mandan, North Dakota. That's M-A-N-D-A-N. Um, zip code 58554. Mm -hmm. So um, this is one of the things that I would really urge people to get involved in if they are desirous of being supportive. Um, mm -hmm. The protectors are really putting it all on the line. What are the mix of people that were out there? Who did you run into? Where did they come from? Did you have a lot of local people? Did you have a lot of folks from, like you, from out of state, from like, what, about 1,500, 1,700 miles away? Um, did you have anybody that came from another country to help out? There were people from around the world who were there. Um, certainly a very, very large local component. Mm -hmm. um, but people from, I want to say, almost every state in the United States and then overseas. That's... It was an international experience. It was great. People helping people, and uh, it doesn't get any better than that. Right. At Ronnie's kitchen, she just had said that um, the people that were leaving were from Scandinavia. Nice. So I think there were like five or six people from Scandinavia that she, she had within her little kitchen space so probably coming from countries where they don't need have to worry about using fossil fuels and a quick shout out to our friend Henry Pietras is here in the audience um, countries that do not depend on fossil fuels like America does because they've gone over to alternative energies to mm -hmm. wind to solar and Germany supplies nearly all of its electric needs and with they, solar now and they right. probably honor their water much more than that's we do. how you honor your water is by using something that doesn't pollute it um, thank you for joining us progressive soup um, hope you've enjoyed the show again Diane Haas and Deborah Cohen thank you and uh, talking about the Dakota Access Pipeline Dapple and what a cute name <laughs> like Panda in New Milford Minnie Wakoni yes okay water is life water is life water is life thank you for protecting the water and helping out in a very important thing and a very important activity and going out there twice. And we're going to have uh, Laura Sage coming on the show in future weeks who was out there also who Deborah mentioned that, that she uh, ran into right. not knowing who it was. Not quite by chance. Thanks so end. much for joining us. I'm David Stevenson and uh, enjoy your week and we'll see you again uh, either on the internet or on Monday, uh, Wednesday 9.30 p.m. Thanks.